All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much, Terry, <clears throat> for uh, the invitation to come speak to all of you this morning. And um, I've been coming to PSB for 20 years and have gotten so much out of this conference. So I just wanted to start by thanking the organizers for all their hard work to put on the best bioinformatics comp bio conference there is. Um, when Terry invited me to give this presentation, she said I could talk about anything I wanted to. And one of the things that has really been front and center uh, in my mind uh, last few months is the mass exodus of talent, you know, of talented young people from academia into industry. Now, certainly industry is an um, absolutely great career path, and I would uh, never uh, tell somebody not to go to industry. But for those of us in academia, it's concerning because we are losing talent. And it's almost impossible to find good postdocs, for example, for our research labs. And so I think this is, a, this is a problem. And I've been thinking a lot about why are young people abandoning academia and finding uh, alternative career paths? What is wrong with academia? And so I've been reflecting on this a lot. I've been in academia now for 25 years. Um, and I've, I've done pretty much everything there is to do. I've started centers and departments. I've run core, core facilities. Um, building a new department right now. Um, I've built infrastructure. I've started education programs, graduate programs. And so I have a lot of experience doing all the various things um, that one does in academia. I've done pretty much everything except being a dean of a medical school, which I would probably never, never want to do. Um, and so I put together this uh, list of lessons that I've learned navigating academia that I wanted to share with you, and especially the young people in the audience, uh, the students, the postdocs, the young faculty, even mid-career faculty, uh, things that I think will help you navigate a career in academia and hopefully make it less scary so that you choose it as a viable career option in addition to all the other options that you have. So I want to start by talking about uh, some strategies and the first one um, is to find good mentors. And this is probably one of the most important things I have to share with you today is the important of, importance of mentorship. And I have been blessed with absolutely fantastic mentors every step of my career. Going back to childhood, I had a father that was a great role model for me for higher education and hard work. Um, I had a great high school biology teacher that really instilled uh, an excitement about science and biology. Um, in college, I had a, a great mentor that taught me how to do experimental biology. In graduate school, I had a mentor that taught me how to do critical thinking. Um, my first faculty position, I had Jonathan Haynes, who's here, um, as a, a fantastic mentor. Jonathan taught me how to write grants, how to navigate uh, academia, the political landscape. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I owe, I owe a lot to my mentors, and, I, and every one of them has helped me get to where I am today. And I, I just can't imagine navigating academia without having all of those mentors. And so my advice to all of you is seek out those people who are going to really care about you, care about your success, spend time with you, and give you good advice uh, every step of the way. And I'm not talking about, you know, departments will often assign a mentor for you, right? And that's somebody that the department wants to make sure you're doing the things you need to do to get promoted. Sometimes those can be good mentors, but often they're just doing a job for on behalf of the department chair, and they don't really care about you as a person so much. So in addition to interacting with those people, you need to find those people that really genuinely care about you. Seek them out, find them, and embrace them. And, and use them as, as resources. Because academia is complex, it's tricky. There's, there's all sorts of uh, challenges that you face along the way, and there's no reason why anyone would know how, how to deal with those situations until you've been through it or until somebody tells you the ins and outs of how it works. Uh, second, find giving collaborators. There are all sorts of different collaborators, but you want those collaborators that are gonna give back to you, right? Um, I had a junior faculty member at my previous institution that I hired, um, and he established a collaboration with a, uh, a clinical researcher, a senior cl clinical researcher. And instead of that person, that senior person, putting him on his grants, giving him some money, some, some NIH money to help with his research projects, he told him, oh, just, just use your startup funds to pay for that. So basically what he was saying is, give me your startup funds to support my research, right? That's unethical, in my opinion, and should never happen. And uh, me as a mentor put a stop to it 
Um, but that's an example of a collaborator who on, at face value had exciting data, exciting research projects, but he was a taker, not a giver. You want to avoid those people. They are just going to make your life miserable, and they don't really care about you. They only care about their own research, their own success, and they're going to use you in any way they can. So find those collaborators that are going to give back. And Scott Williams is here, I think, in the audience, and Scott is um, one of my longest collaborators. We've been collaborating for over 20 years, and um, I think we've published probably more than 50 papers together over that period of time. And, you know, we're philosophically aligned, but we have complementary skills, and we give to each other. We've supported each other and helped each other every, every step of the way. And th those meaningful lifetime collaborations can be huge, absolutely huge for a career. So find those giving collaborators. Administrators. Um, everything we do in a university or academic setting depends on administrators, right? Managing budgets, grant submissions, grant management, uh, HR for hiring, um, administrative assistance for all the other little things that we do in academic life. And there are all kinds of administrators. Some are good, some are bad. In my experience, there's three kinds of administrators. There are those who are qualified, who um, genuinely care about helping you and helping the institution. Those are the ones you want to find and work with. There are those who may be qualified, but are more worried about their own job security, right? CYA, making sure they don't do something wrong and get in trouble that might affect their annual bonus or their raise or their, even their job security. And so they tend to be very conservative and tend to say no more than they say yes and they can be a roadblock um, to, to your progress. And then, of course, there are administrators who are just incompetent or have other issues that, uh, uh, you know, uh, get in your way. So what I've found is that, you know, it's often the case that if you encounter a difficult administrator or somebody who's just throwing up roadblocks for no good reason, there are sometimes ways to get around that and find other people who, who can help you. And so a lot of the challenge of academia is finding those pathways through the system to get what you need done. And that's where good mentors, right, can come into play because they, they've been through that and they can help direct you through the path of least resistance to get done. And if you're a junior faculty member, this is really critical because you have a very short period of time usually to, you know, maybe five years to uh, get a grant funded, publish papers, establish a national reputation so you can get promoted and get tenured. And those roadblocks that administrators put up can really have a dramatic effect on your ability to get things done and make progress over what is a very, very, usually a very, very short period of time. Um, this goes without saying, but be productive. And in my experience, good things come from productivity. There is no downside to being productive. I believe in work-life balance. I think that's important, and we should all strive for that, for our own personal sanity, if nothing else and for our family members, but it may, what I'm saying is it's probably worth spending those extra five or maybe 10 weekends a year writing that extra grant, getting that extra grant out the door, getting that extra paper or two out the door. Productivity leads to good things. It leads to more funding. It leads to better salary. Uh, it leads to endowed chairs. It leads to promotion. Um, so find those weekends in the year where you can do that extra bit uh, and still maintain your work-life work balance and your sanity. Uh, network and market. We're all here at a conference, and so all of you young people should be networking. You should be meeting and talking to as absolutely many people as you can, both your peers, right, find those good collaborators, but also us senior folks who are senior members of the field. Come talk to us. We love coming to PSB and meeting people and talking. Um, and this is important. It's important for you to get to know people in the field because a big part of promotion from assistant to associate professor is establishing a national reputation. And what happens when you go up for promotion, your university solicits letters from people like me in the field to comment on your work. And if I know you, if I've met you, if I've read your papers, I'm more likely to give a fav write a strong letter than if I've never met you, have no clue who you are, have no clue what your work is about. Um, and so networking and marketing are really critical for getting your name out there, getting your work noticed, getting your work cited, um, and that then leads to uh, better chances for promotion and all other good things. And I'll tell you a story about marketing. Uh, first, let me say about networking. Um, early in my career as an assistant professor, I uh, had my annual meeting with my department chair, and he said, Jason, you travel too much. 
And of course, I ignored him and kept traveling. And, um, but that traveling was a very important part of me building a reputation and, and building collaborations and getting to know people. But you have to be able to, to get work done while you travel, right? Write a paper on an airplane, work in your hotel room in the morning before the conference. You have to be willing to do that. What I'd love to do is go back to that department chair and hold up my CV and say, okay, what part of traveling did, not, uh, did you not like or did you not think led to success? So um, marketing is really important too. One of the things I did as an assistant professor, we developed a software package. Um, and what I did was I made little CD, uh, business card size CD-ROMs that would fit in a CD-ROM and you could read it on your computer. It looked just like a business card. It had my name, had my email address, had my, con you know, my contact information, the name of the software. And on the CD, I had the software, I had example data sets, I had the publication for the, for the software, I had other, you know, other how-tos and, and everything everybody needed to know to use and, and get to know our software. And when I'd go present posters, like at this conference, I would hand them out. Every time somebody would come by, I would hand out those CD-ROMs. I handed out hundreds of those CD-ROMs over the course of a couple years. Uh, that's marketing. That's helping get, get your name and your software and your ideas out there. So networking and marketing are really important. Your trainees are your legacy. Nobody's going to read your papers in 50 years, but the students you train are going to be around, and they are going to be impacting the field. I have trainees that come to this conference, and they have trainees, and that's my legacy. Um, people who train with me learn my way of thinking about things, my philosophy, and some of that carries on into their careers. And so even though none of you are gonna read my papers in 20 or 30 years, um, you will be reading the papers and being impacted by the students I've trained. And so uh, the lesson here is, you know, treat your students well, mentor them, establish lifelong relationships with them, because that's your legacy. That's the impact that you're gonna have on the world is through your students, not necessarily your own work. Fight for your salary. I remember when I was an assistant professor, I was sitting in my office one day and I was thinking about salary and thinking that I wasn't paid enough and I just thought, you know, damn it, I'm gonna fight for my salary the rest of my career. Every single day I'm gonna fight for my salary for what I think I'm worth, and I did that. And my salary has gone up rapidly over many, many years. Um, and so it's hard to fight for salary. It's, it's a difficult thing. Mentors can help you with that and find strategies for fighting for salary. But as an assistant professor, it's a really hard thing to do, especially uh, for women, right? That's one of the reasons that there's a discrepancy, you know, in addition to discrimination between, uh, you know, between male and female salaries. And so I would encourage everybody to fight for the salary. You have to justify it, of course. You have to have good reason for why you need more salary. Uh, but there are a lot of strategies for doing that, but you have to be assertive. And I was assertive, and my salary rose very quickly throughout my career. Be willing to change institutions. Now, I understand everybody can't change institutions. Some of you are locked into a particular place because of family or spouses or other, other things that you, you can't move, and that's okay. You make the best of it. But if you can change institutions, if you are mobile, um, it, can, it can work in your, your favor. I've, I've uh, now spanned four different decades at four different institutions, and every time I've moved, it's been good for me. I've gotten more salary, I've gotten more money, I've gotten more power, um, and importantly, I've gotten new ideas. One of the things I love, every time I have changed institutions, it's been like doing a sabbatical. I've had time to refocus my research program. And every time I've moved, I've had new research ideas and new things that I've, I've taken on and, and exciting things that have led to new grants and new, I, new papers. And, um, and so it can be stimulating to change institutions in addition to all the other benefits that come from that. Now, of course, there's an art to um, negotiating with a, a new institution, to negotiating with your current institution if you decide to stay, and again, a good mentor can help you through that process uh, and decide whether it's a good idea, the right way to do it. But for me, changing institutions every single time has been a really, really good thing. So something to keep in mind. Um, the older people in the room know this. Universities don't love you. Not one bit. Get that through your head now. And there's a reason for that. If you think about deans, being a dean, is 
a hard job, which is why I never want to do it. I never want to be a dean. Deans spend their days putting out big fires. Day to day, it's one crisis to the next, and that is their job. And so they don't have time to be proactive or to say, hey, you're doing a great job. Let's, let's pay some attention to you this week and get you what you need to be successful. They don't have time for that because they're dealing with financial crises. They're dealing with ethics violations. They're dealing with you know, uh, donors and big things. They're dealing with you know, provosts and boards. And it's, it's a nightmare job, which is why deans don't last very long. The typical dean at a US medical school lasts, what, three years, four years at most? Um, it's rare to have a dean last more than three or four years. And, Many of you are probably aware of that. So deans don't have time to love you. They care more about their own job and their own, you know, their, their own accomplishments and dealing with the crisis of the day. And so that you know, just means that you, know, you and your mentors have to look out for you because uh, the upper level administration is not gonna do so. All right, let me um, move on to a few words of advice. First one's obvious, be nice. Um, I've encountered so many mean, angry people in my career, and it just really serves no purpose. Um, be nice, even, even if you don't feel like being nice. I, I think there's only an upside to being nice. Um, you know, look, when you, when you meet somebody, and are not nice to them, they're gonna remember that, and they're gonna talk about you, they're gonna tell their buddy, they're gonna tell their colleagues, hey, I met this guy, and he's, you know, he's, he's, he's not a nice person. Science is a very small community. We're all only one, two, maybe three steps removed from each other, and word gets around, um, and you would be surprised what a small community we are, um, even, you know, even across computer science and statistics and, mathematics and biology and medicine, we're all connected by very few steps. Um, it's kind of a practical thing, if nothing else, uh, because eventually that person that you're not nice to is gonna be reviewing your paper, it's gonna be reviewing your grant, right? And that's gonna create conscious or unconscious bias on the behalf of the person you weren't nice to. And so there's a practical side to being nice, is that people are more gonna be more likely to do nice things for you if you're nice to them. So be nice. Trust your gut. This is something I've done my entire career and it's worked for me. When I was a graduate student, um, I applied for some faculty positions and got some offers. And I remember my last year of graduate school, I had offers and was talking to the faculty in the department and faculty visitors. And I asked everybody this question, should I go do a postdoc or should I take a faculty position right out of graduate school? Every single person, probably 30 people that I talked to said, do a postdoc. It'll be a huge mistake if you go take a faculty position. I ignored them all, I took a faculty position and I never looked back and it was absolutely 100% the right decision for me. And I trusted my gut because I knew I wanted to do it, I knew I was ready, I had things I wanted to do, I didn't want to get slowed down by doing a postdoc. Um, and so every piece of advice I got was wrong, 100% wrong. So there are those times where, where you have to trust your gut. If you're passionate and you know what you want to do, do it. Don't take things personally. There are a lot of not nice people in science, and my experience is that it's almost never personal. It's always due to some, some issue with the person who's not being nice, right? They're under pressure, they're having family issues, um, you know, they're under stress, they're feeding their ego, they're, you know, maybe they lack empathy. You know, there are all sorts of reasons why people are not nice to you or do things that are not in your best interest. And it's almost never personal. And so fight that urge to take it personally. And just say to yourself, okay, what's wrong with this person? Why are they acting like that? I know it's not about me. Why are they acting like that? Um, it doesn't change the situation, but it might make it a little less stressful, right? And, and, and because if you take it personally, then you, you get angry, and then you are thinking about ways to attack that person. Uh, and then that just gets into a cycle that you don't want to be in. That's a waste of time, a waste of energy, um, and not in your best interest. So, so it's hard. It's hard not to take things personally. It's hard not to be defensive. Um, but that's my advice. In my experience, 
Um, and I've had plenty of people that have not been nice to me in my career in 25 years, lots of people, but I, can't, I don't know if I can think of a single one where it was personal. Focus on your research. Um, I was in one of my previous chairs, I, I was in his office one day complaining about something, I don't even remember what it was, but I was upset about something and complaining to him and, and he said, you know, Jason, I don't think there's anything you can do about this situation, but he said, you know, when I face situations like this, I close the door and I focus on my research. We all have our research to go back to because that's what we love, right? That's what we enjoy doing. That's why we're doing this is because we love our research. And so you can always close your door if things aren't going well and focus on your, focus on your work. That's, you know, that should be our happy place, right? Um, I thought that was really good advice and I've, I've um, taken that advice to heart and, um, and I, I, I think it can help. Uh, fight fear of failure. Um, I know so many smart people, smarter than me, who are just um, paralyzed by fear of failure, right? They don't want to write a grant for an RFA because they're afraid it won't get a good review because it's outside their comfort zone. Um, or maybe not submit to a journal um, that, for that reason. Or maybe not take a job, right? Or take on a new leadership position because they're afraid they might fail. Look, academia is full of failure. We all fail. Those of us that are senior, we have gray hair for a reason because we've failed over and over and over again, and failure is part of the job. It's part of, you know, it, it, it's, um, you, you have to get used to failure and not be afraid of it, and in many cases, embrace it. If I look back on the lessons that I've learned in, throughout my career, the biggest lessons have come from failures, right? Where I've done something wrong or made, the, made a wrong decision or um, was embarrassed in some way, and. Well, you learn from that. When you're embarrassed in front of a bunch of people, you learn from that real quick, and you get better, and you don't do that again. Um, and so um, embrace failure. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, go outside your comfort zone. Um, I've had so much grant funding success doing things I know nothing about. After 9-11, uh, Congress put a billion dollars into infectious uh, bioterrorism research. I was sitting there on my, at my desk reading the newspaper. I said, a billion dollars? Man, I should get a piece of that. So, and I've never had an immunology class in my life. I, I knew nothing about infectious disease or bioterrorism. I started looking around my university. I found a guy that was doing smallpox research and had collected some data. I wrote an R1 and it got funded. I had that grant for 10 years. I knew nothing about immunology. I answered another RFA about eye diseases. I'd never worked on eye diseases, never published a single eye disease paper, wrote a grant, got it funded, had that grant for five years. So I was going outside my comfort zone. I was taking a chance. I was, you know, uh, so uh, be willing to do that. Don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid to apologize. There's so much defensiveness in science when you do something wrong, right? Our first instinct is to say, oh, it wasn't my fault. It, 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 blame it on something else, right? Be defensive. We, we all have that human instinct to do that. I remember early in my career, I was uh, head of a bioinformatics corps for a program project grant. Uh, with a prominent PI at the institution, and, and he called me into his office one day, and he said, Jason, how come you haven't gotten that stuff done? You know, what the heck? Uh, we're giving you all this money, and you're not delivering. And I could have been defensive. I could have blamed it on a whole bunch of other things, but my instinct was just to say, you know, I'm sorry. I screwed up. I'll, I'll make it right. And, and I could see the look on his face. He was ready for a fight, right? He was ready for me to be defensive. Him. He was ready to lay into me and give me, give me hell over not getting this stuff done. And I apologized, and I could see the change in the look on his face. He was like, oh, you know? And I think at that moment, he had a lot more respect for me. And, uh, and, and, and I did, I went back and I made it right, and we had a great, a great relationship from that point on. So don't be afraid to apologize, an, an apology can go a long way. Remove the chip on your shoulder. I've seen so many bright young scientists come out of high power lab, science cell, nature papers. They come, they come in as an assistant professor and, you know, I'm so-and-so from so-and-so's lab and I've got such and such publications. I don't need your help. I'm, I'm better than all of you and I'm gonna, you know, and then after three years, it's like, oh shit, tenure's coming up and I haven't accomplished anything, right? So, you know, get, get rid of that chip on your shoulder. Everybody needs help. Everybody needs mentoring. Everybody needs to figure out how to navigate the system. You can't do it alone no matter 
how many science cell and nature papers you have or you know, how many National Academy of Science members you trained with, you are an individual and you're gonna have the same struggles that everybody else has. So knock that chip on your shoulder and get help from day one. Find those mentors, find those collaborators on day one, don't wait. Find your passion. You know, heart, success in academia requires hard work. There's just no way around it. And it's easier to work hard if you're passionate about what you, what you do. And I would say don't let, don't, don't let others tell you what to work on. Find, find, be, work on what you want to work on. Find your passion. That's, that's what's going to get you those extra weekends, those late nights working hard. Uh, find your passion. All right, I'm going to end here. Um, this is just a, a visual summary of everything I've talked about. Um, Yep, I'll stop there. <laughs>